So I'd like to tell you all a story about a seven-year-old boy who has been raised as a Rastafarian, which meant that he followed a strict vegan diet, had dreadlocks, and he fo fo lived his life with key principles of respect for the planet, his community, and his body. His family stood out like a sore thumb in the community that he lived within, and sometimes it was a bit you know, unusual to see this mass of individuals traveling through the community they lived in. As a little boy, he was often told that he wasn't like other little boys, possibly because he didn't like sports, and he couldn't think of anything worse than having to watch Match of the Day or the program that comes on Saturday afternoons where they give the football results or the, or the other sports. He really wasn't interested. But what he did enjoy was listening to his dad's vinyl records, reading a good book, and going on a, a journey while he was reading those books. Now, as I stand here today, you might be surprised to learn, or maybe not that surprised to learn, that that little boy was me. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit to when I was 11. And effectively, I went to school with a group of kids that my parents went to school with their, with their parents. So we actually spent a lot of time together. We hung out on the weekends. And then when we went to school, we kind of had a lot of fun. So we weren't necessarily always taking our education as seriously as we should have. So one day, I was in a class with a female friend of mine. And we were having a conversation, possibly about Michael Jackson, or Janet Jackson, or EastEnders and what happened the night before, and quite rightly, we weren't paying attention to our teacher. So the teacher honed in on what we were doing, and quite rightly asked us to be quiet. When the class finished, he asked me to stay behind, because he wanted to have a conversation with me. And that conversation was about me being a man, and the fact that when I grew up, I'd have to provide for a family. Now my friend, because she's a girl, would be able to marry a man who would take care of her. Up until that point, I actually hadn't had the consideration about that conversation. I did think that me and my friend were on the same trajectory, that we were kind of moving in the same direction. And when he said that to me, I was a little bit taken aback. And I wasn't sure if it's because of the family that I grew up in, where my mum and dad both worked, but also were involved in the activities of the children. My dad cooked and cleaned. And I really didn't see any difference between their roles within our family. So when the teacher said that, I was a little bit thrown. So I went home and I told my dad what the teacher said to me. And uh, so I said, I asked my dad, I told my dad what he just said to me, and I really kind of was a little bit thrown by it because I suddenly had this vision of me being this 30 year old, having a wife and kids and a family that I need to provide for, and felt really quite overwhelmed by that, being an 11 year old, uh, having to make this sudden <laughs> feeling of I'm responsible. And my dad, being the first generation of individuals born in the UK, Black Britons born in the UK after the Windrush, was really kind of someone that had experienced some quite traumatic things. And if I told you about those stories, you'd probably cry. But in turn, that meant that as a person, he really wanted to make sure that his children knew that we could talk to him and that he was there to listen. So we had a conversation about what the teacher had said to me. And effectively, he asked me about the women in my community. And I instantly thought about my grandmothers. They both traveled from the Caribbean to the UK to be a part of the rebuilding of Britain. And they'd made decisions for themselves. They both worked and made their own money and had agency around their journeys. And one of my grandmothers was a shop steward for her, um, her organization that she worked for. And she really kind of drove her, she, had, she was the voice of the people for the, for the team that she supervised. So we, she was really kind of like this bold, powerful lady. So it was amazing. So he then asked me, do I really think that my friend needs to grow up and marry a man that will take care of her? And I responded, no. So jump forward a little bit to when I was 18. And I worked in a cinema chain where I sold popcorn, uh, <laughs> ice cream, and fizzy drinks on a concession stand. And I really enjoyed the job because I'm an avid film watcher. I love film. I think it's one of the most amazing things. And while doing that role, um, one day, I, uh, as I was looking down, the supervisor accused me of stealing £12.67. Now, I'll always remember the £12.67 because it was a weird number to think that someone would steal. Um, so there I was, standing in his office, being asked to turn out my pockets, take off my shoes, wiggle my toes, jump on the spot, all to prove that I hadn't stolen this money. He then made me walk across the foyer while everyone looked at me to my locker to rummage through that to, again, check if I'd stolen this £12.67. Now, quite rightly, it was a bit of an uncomfortable situation because I felt very profiled. So when I got home, walked in through the front door, slammed that, stormed up the stairs, slammed the door, turned on some loud music and stomped on the floor. My dad, hearing me stomping around the house, kind of came up and was like, why are you slamming my doors? <laughs> and um, I started to cry. I hadn't cried at that point for a very long time, so it was a little bit of a, you know, a moment where I was having a release. I was feeling disappointed about what happened at work, felt like I was being profiled, but also a bit uncomfortable. 
My dad looked at me, turned around and walked off. And I was like, oh my God, should I not be crying? Am I showing a sign of weakness? Is this the right thing? But actually, what my dad had gone to do was collect his two favorite things, which was a can of cherry coke and a Twix. <laughs> when we saw those in the cupboard, we weren't allowed to actually eat them, so the fact that he gave that to me was really a nice moment. <laughs> so I was sitting there eating the can of, drinking the can of coke and eating the Twix, and we had a conversation about what happened. And he asked me, how do you feel? And I said to him, actually, I feel really undervalued. I don't feel like the organization that I worked for trusted me, and I don't want to be there anymore. So he said to me, don't you think that you could work with them to help evolve their culture and challenge the fact that they did that thing to you? And I was like, I don't want to. <laughs> so the next day, I actually did go in and hand in my notice, because I was at university at the time, and felt like I had other things that I needed to do, and challenging that system felt like a way greater thing that I wanted to do at that time. But these two conversations that I had with my dad were kind of moments where he got me to think about equality and fairness and how it would show up for me and others in my community. To fast forward to present day, I work in changing, helping organizations change their culture and reflecting on what they do. I'm the global head of DNI um, at a Global Fashion House, but I've been in the DNI space for over a decade now. Again, a role that didn't exist when I was 11, so I'd never thought about doing that. So DNI is a subject is about creating moments for everyone to learn from each other and to really kind of have that human connection. So in the working environment, it's about helping everyone to think about what got you to the seats that you all sit in isn't the same journey that I took to sit in the seat that I sit in. So we celebrate key moments like International Women's Day, Black History Month, World Disability Day, Pride Month, and these are all things to kind of build that education and understanding that the flow and ebb of the careers that we go on. Now, Changing cultures is hard. Having these conversations sometimes is uncomfortable for people, but we need to push forward and celebrate those that do it well. But the new thing that we get to do is we get to create these moments of policies where hopefully those policies create positive action. And I hope you noticed I didn't say positive discrimination, because there's nothing positive about discrimination. But positive action moves us into a place where people are really learning and getting to understand how our workplaces, our communities, and places where we come together to build insights from each other. Now, as we think about that, I often say that the world of work is designed for a man who's a little bit like Don Draper, for those of you that watch Mad Men, where he's out for himself, he's not really about the community, he's not about building, bringing in ideas, he's really about enjoying himself and doing things that really drive him forward. But that's not where we want to work. We want to work in a place where everyone can thrive. And I think the next generation are really connected to that purpose and that vision around how we move forward. So I'm of the firm belief that we actually need to give our, in, our next generation the tools they need to drive that forward. So in 2015, I became the co-founder of Rocking Your Teens, which is an organization set up to help young people think about their careers, their mental well-being, but also that kind of really amazing gift that who we are is the uniqueness and the specialness. Now, a lot of the work that we do is about helping these young people think about their careers and the journeys that they go through. And how do they speak to the adults in their lives, but also how do they kind of learn from each other? But what is the real world of work? And how do the careers that we go on actually, um, what do, how do they go on the careers that they're going to go on? And what does that actually look like? So as we do that, we create these moments for people to really kind of reflect and learn and create those spaces for the children to really understand what their careers are. So, sorry, I've lost my train of thought here. <laughs> so it's not always easy listening to some of the young people that we hear from. And a lot of them kind of feel that uh, the, the, their parents don't understand what they're going through, and they don't understand the journeys that they need to walk on. But I've been fortunate to grow up in a family where my parents really did listen to me, and they had those moments where they challenged me to reflect on what was going on in society around me. They made me think about how I could be a better person and influence the communities that I lived within, but also go out and shine a light on others doing really great work. Now, that's always a challenge for others to go and do, but it's the thing that we all need to kind of go out into our communities and do. So as I think about what my dad taught me, he taught me how to, to listen, how to understand that women may not experience the world in the same way as me, but it would be okay for me to challenge that and to build those moments to build in the community to kind of express my feelings and my emotions, so it's okay to cry, it's okay to be angry, but it's okay to process that information. 
As a father myself, I often hope, and I really want to make sure that my son knows that I'm here for him to kind of really make sure that he's able to grow up and be a confident individual that gives back to our communities. And I urge you all to take that consideration to think about that as well. Thank you.